Dagny turned at her approach. Among the many things that Lillian resented, the impersonal politeness of Dagny's face was the one she resented most. What do you think of your brother's marriage, Miss Taggart? she asked casually, smiling. I have no opinion about it. Do you mean to say that you don't find it worthy of any thought? If you wish to be exact, yes, that's what I mean. Oh, but don't you see any human significance in it? No. Don't you think that a person such as your brother's bride does deserve some interest? Why, no. I envy you, Miss Taggart. I envy your Olympian detachment. It is, I think, the secret of why lesser mortals can never hope to equal your success in the field of business. They allow their attention to be divided, at least to the extent of acknowledging achievements in other fields. What achievements are we talking about? Don't you grant any recognition at all to the women who attain unusual heights of conquest, not in the industrial, but in the human realm? I don't think that there is such a word as conquest in the human realm. Oh, but consider, for instance, how hard other women would have had to work, if work were the only means available to them, to achieve what this girl has achieved through the person of your brother. I don't think she knows the exact nature of what she has achieved. Reardon saw them together. He approached. He felt that he had to hear it, no matter what the consequences. He stopped silently beside them. He did not know whether Lillian was aware of his presence. He knew that Dagny was. Do show a little generosity toward her, Miss Taggart, said Lillian. At least the generosity of attention. You must not despise the women who do not possess your brilliant talent, but who exercise their own particular endowments. Nature always balances her gifts and offers compensations. Don't you think so? I'm not sure I understand you. Oh, I'm sure you don't want to hear me become more explicit. Why, yes, I do. Lillian shrugged angrily. Among the women who were her friends, she would have been understood and stopped long ago. But this was an adversary new to her, a woman who refused to be hurt. She did not care to speak more clearly, but she saw Reardon looking at her. She smiled and said, Well, consider your sister-in-law, Miss Taggart. What chance did she have to rise in the world? None, by your exacting standards. She could not have made a successful career in business. She does not possess your unusual mind. Besides, men would have made it impossible for her. They would have found her too attractive. So she took advantage of the fact that men have standards which unfortunately are not as high as yours. She resorted to talents which I am sure you despise. You have never cared to compete with us lesser women in the sole field of our ambition, in the achievement of power over men. If you call it power, Mrs. Reardon, then no, I haven't. She turned to go, but Lillian's voice stopped her. I would like to believe that you are fully consistent, Miss Taggart, and fully devoid of human frailties. I would like to believe that you've never felt the desire to flatter or to offend anyone. But I see that you expected both Henry and me to be here tonight. Why, no, I can't say that I did. I had not seen my brother's guest list. Then why are you wearing that bracelet? Dagny's eyes moved deliberately straight to hers. I always wear it. Don't you think that's carrying a joke too far? It was never a joke, Mrs. Reardon. Then you'll understand me if I say that I'd like you to give that bracelet back to me. I understand you, but I will not give it back. Lillian let a moment pass, as if to let them both acknowledge the meaning of their silence. For once, she held Dagny's glance without smiling. What do you expect me to think, Miss Taggart? Anything you wish. What is your motive? You knew my motive when you gave me the bracelet. Lillian glanced at Reardon. His face was expressionless. She saw no reaction, no hint of intention to help her or stop her. Nothing but an attentiveness that made her feel as if she were standing in a spotlight. Her smile came back as a protective shield, an amused, patronizing smile intended to convert the subject into a drawing-room issue again. I'm sure, Miss Taggart, that you realize how enormously improper this is. No. But surely you know that you are taking a dangerous and ugly risk. No. You do not take into consideration the possibility of being misunderstood. No. Lillian shook her head in smiling reproach. 
Miss Taggart, don't you think that this is a case where one cannot afford to indulge in abstract theory, but must consider practical reality? Dagny would not smile. I have never understood what is meant by a statement of that kind. I mean that your attitude may be highly idealistic, as I am sure it is, but unfortunately most people do not share your lofty frame of mind and will misinterpret your action in the one manner which would be most abhorrent to you. Then the responsibility and the risk will be theirs, not mine. I admire your... No, I must not say innocence. But shall I say purity? You have never thought of it, I am sure, but life is not as straight and logical as as a railroad track. It is regrettable, but possible, that your high intentions may lead people to suspect things which... well, which I am sure you know to be of a sordid and scandalous nature. Dagny was looking straight at her. I don't. But you cannot ignore that possibility. I do. Dagny turned to go. Oh, but should you wish to evade a discussion if you have nothing to hide? Dagny stopped. And if your brilliant and reckless courage permits you to gamble with your reputation, should you ignore the danger to Mr. Reardon? Dagny asked slowly, What is the danger to Mr. Reardon? I'm sure you understand me. I don't. Oh, but surely it isn't necessary to be more explicit. It is if you wish to continue this discussion. Lillian's eyes went to Reardon's face, searching for some sign to help her decide whether to continue or to stop. He would not help her. Miss Taggart, she said, I am not your equal in philosophical attitude. I am only an average wife. Please give me that bracelet, if you do not wish me to think what I might think and what you wouldn't want me to name. Mrs. Reardon, is this the manner and place in which you choose to suggest that I am sleeping with your husband? Certainly not. The cry was immediate. It had a sound of panic and the quality of an automatic reflex, like the jerk of withdrawal of a pickpocket's hand caught in action. She added with an angry, nervous chuckle, in a tone of sarcasm and sincerity that confessed a reluctant admission of her actual opinion, that would be the possibility farthest from my mind. Then you will please apologize to Miss Taggart, said Reardon. Dagny caught her breath, cutting off all but the faint echo of a gasp. They both whirled to him. Lillian saw nothing in his face. Dagny saw torture. It isn't necessary, Hank, she said. It is, for me, he answered coldly, not looking at her. He was looking at Lillian in the manner of a command that could not be disobeyed. Lillian studied his face with mild astonishment, but without anxiety or anger, like a person confronted by a puzzle of no significance. But of course, she said complacently, her voice smooth and confident again, please accept my apology, Miss Taggart, if I gave you the impression that I suspected the existence of a relationship which I would consider improbable for you and, from my knowledge of his inclinations, impossible for my husband. She turned and walked away indifferently, leaving them together, as if in deliberate proof of her words. Dagny stood still, her eyes closed. She was thinking of the night when Lillian had given her the bracelet. He had taken his wife's side then. He had taken hers now. Of the three of them, she was the only one who understood fully what this meant. Whatever is the worst you may wish to say to me, you will be right. She heard him and opened her eyes. He was looking at her coldly, his face harsh, allowing no sign of pain or apology to suggest a hope of forgiveness. Dearest, don't torture yourself like that, she said. I knew that you're married. I've never tried to evade that knowledge. I'm not hurt by it tonight. Her first word was the most violent of the several blows he felt. She had never used that word before. She had never let him hear that particular tone of tenderness. She had never spoken of his marriage in the privacy of their meetings. Yet she spoke of it here with effortless simplicity. She saw the anger in his face, the rebellion against pity. 
the look of saying to her contemptuously that he had betrayed no torture and needed no help. Then the look of realization that she knew his face as thoroughly as he knew hers. He closed his eyes, inclined his head a little, and he said very quietly, Thank you.